programme this week we're going to be talking about rural women. Now I know that they're involved with a lot of projects but basically we're going to be talking at support as far as depression is concerned, getting people out and making sure that your neighbours are on top of everything. People this week are talking about the cattle rustling that's been going on and what really is happening as far as Nate is concerned. Also, the cold snap has been and gone, but we're going to be having a very dry summer by the look of it. New Zealand workers are lazy, that's why we need immigrants. That's the word, including that of the Prime Minister at the moment. Tom Walsh breaks some New Zealand records as far as shop putting is concerned. Grain feed industry continues to be advertised as being in chaos. And also the local body election make sure that you know who is going to be in charge of your funds for the next three years. But in just a moment, it's animal health, prevention and cure. Nick Zoonosis. Yeah, zoonosis, great word, isn't it? Isn't it a All great word, but I'd love lovely. to know what it meant. Yeah, so basically it's diseases that humans can contract off animals, and so there's a number of them, and they're quite pertinent in the, in the rural sector as you can imagine. So um, I guess we're not going to get through all of them, this is just a list of a mile long, but we can maybe touch on some of the uh, very important ones. And I guess right at the top of the list, um, in this kind of OSH regulated world we live in or country we live in at the moment would be leptospirosis because it's exceptionally prominent and well recognised within the dairy industry. And the reason for that is that uh, it's a bacterial disease and the bug that causes it is transferred in urine. Um, and so especially the, the, in the pits of the old fashioned herringbone sheds if there's still some functional and uh, you know um, being exposed to, to urine splashes from even the big rotaries, it's, um, it's obviously a high risk scenario potentially for staff working in the milking shed. The bug actually gets through mucous membranes, so the moist membranes of the body. Eyes are particularly, you know, problematic um, through the mouth. And as you can imagine, it's not a it's not a big leap of faith to imagine that, you know, when you've got uh, cows urinating on the platform, that we're going to get urine splashes. So it's particularly important to bear that in mind when we're talking about protecting ourselves from. Um, contracting this disease. It's a terrible problem. It's unlikely to result in death, but it, it makes people very, very sick. But they feel as though they're a dang. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's a very, very <clears throat> serious condition. Um, they're febrile and really excessive flu symptoms, can't get out of bed, muscle aches, and that can last for, for days to weeks. Um, particularly important is being uh, on top of things in relation to communicating with your veterinarian in regards to making sure that the vaccination status is up to scratch with the cows in particular. So we know that fully vaccinated and immunised cows shed organisms at a much reduced rate. So you're much less likely to be exposed from the to the to the bug to the bacteria in a herd that's well well vaccinated and has a good preventative uh, leptospirosis plan in place. So it's something to be particularly uh, noteworthy of um, and it's probably one of the biggies. In recent times in, in fact um, it's been shown that sheep have been a major transmittance um, in, in, in uh, relation to workers at, at freezing works and abattoirs and so in the past we thought sheep were just an end stage, a dead end for this disease but it's becoming becoming well recognised that actually in the processing of sheep meat um, it renders abattoir workers at, at risk. So there's, there's a lot more work being done in that regard as well. Toxoplasmosis has got some pretty nasty side effects. Yeah, toxo's a biggie and, um, and a lot of people that are women that are watching that have been pregnant, they may recall that they've been tested for this. Immunity's lifelong but the problem comes um, particularly if you're exposed to the to the parasite, it's a little single cellular parasite. If you're exposed to this in pregnancy, it can infect the placenta and it can actually result in, in loss of a pregnancy. So it's particularly uh, worrisome and noteworthy when it comes to to women and the, that that are, that are watching. Um, so it's a tricky little thing. There's two real ways of uh, of transmitting it. One is um, the primary host is the cat. And so 
when there's chance of getting contaminated cat feces and then inadvertently having those cysts from the cat feces transferred to food or mouth that's a particular problem so cleaning up kids toys in a sand pit or playground um, or you know I guess working in the hay shed and things where, where cats are prone to, to, to do their business that's a, a high risk situation but perhaps <clears throat> probably more recognisable is in handling raw meat and so we can get cyst transferred through the carcasses of affected animals so sheep meat, cow meat, um, when, when this raw meat's being handled it's possible that cysts are transferred from the meat onto the hands and, and there into the, into the mouth and that's how infection can be, can be maintained so pretty much the cat the way the, tra the parasite's transmitted is typically a cat will eat an infected carcass um, and the cyst will go to the cat and then the adult parasite will reproduce within the cat and shed thousands and thousands of spores but we can get, we can get infected through infected meat as well as, as, well as, as uh, through cat, cat poos. So, Oof. Mm. Oof. Oof, scabby mouth. Um, so scabby mouth, most sheep farmers will know about, it's a particularly prob problematic disease when it comes to, to lambs, um, can put them off their tucker pretty quick when we get horrible scabby infected lesions around the mouth, it's a viral infection and typically it's transmitted when that virus gets into breaks in the skin, so for instance lambs, particularly if there's a lot of thistles or gorse around that they're nibbling on, that's how they damage their, their face and lips and that's where the where the bug gets it, where the virus gets into the into the skin. It's a very, very resistant virus. It can it can stay viable for years and years in the environment, decades in fact. Um, and so um, it's very, very easy in a contaminated environment to get to get infected. Um, the typical scenario is a little blister on the finger where you've had a little thistle lesion or something that's been contaminated with the virus. But if you've got open wounds, uh, be particularly noteworthy that you need to be um, avoiding high risk situations or high risk environments. There's, some, there's been some horrible cases, for instance I remember uh, uh, seeing a picture of a man that was fell from a power line and got badly burnt from electrocution and fell into a paddock that was very muddy and contaminated with, with <coughs> ore virus and he had just horrendous lesions all over his face. So any open wounds you're going to be very, very prone uh, to developing to developing off. So um, I think not only handling affected animals in this sense, but contaminated parts of the farm. If you know you've got scabby mouth on the property, um, dealing with thistles and things, making sure you're not uh, not exposed to that, that sort of environment with lots of open wounds and wearing the, the, the appropriate protection is going to see you well. Nick, thank you very much indeed. Just a moment, we're going to be talking to Joe Goodhue about animal rustling. The rustling of stock, it's getting pretty bad. Yeah, and, and last week um, an incident reported in Ashburton, 500 dairy cows. That's a lot to go missing, but it's not an isolated incident. And it's pretty difficult because, um, you know, this is a large number, but at times they go missing in smaller numbers and it's pretty hard to keep track of them. But anyway, this has been reported and it's really hard to police. I mean, it's likely to have happened at night. Um, these animals are, of course, valuable. So we're talking in excess of seven. $150,000 worth of stock. Um, my colleague Ian McKelvey has put a bill in the members ballot to increase the penalties for um, as it being an aggravating factor if um, it's stock that is rustled. So uh, that's a members bill, that's very worthy and I'm sure that the farmers of Mid Canterbury would be pleased to see it drawn. What I can't understand and nor can a lot of others is how they get around the nate and get them into a different herd. Yeah, and, and that's a, that is a big question and I can't answer how they would go about doing it, but the interesting thing is we don't seem to catch the people that are doing it. So, yeah, I guess that's um, one particular pathway we should be tracking. But as I say, it certainly doesn't seem to have got the perpetrators into trouble thus far. Now, you're talking about big numbers at the moment, but there's a lot that sort of get trickled, just one or two at a time. Yeah, and I, harder and harder to actually track and, um, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, sometimes there's the, the mayhem that 
farmers will find out in their paddocks where stock have been slaughtered and various parts of the animals, usually sheep, have been left behind. Um, there's also the worry about whether people that will go to these lengths to take stock and to benefit financially clearly from it uh, might have firearms on them and whether anyone trying to um, take them to task might be at risk too. So it's a dangerous business. And straight after the break we're going to go out to Lincoln and talk about brown fat. Be Active begins here, in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant, natural, 100% pure, manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant, the way the world is growing. Working with nature, good for the plant, good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at ontheland.co.nz. Now brown fat, it's still very important. Yeah, brown fat and lamb still important. Um, we're really interested in um, lamb survival still. We think that that's one of the areas where we'll get increase in productivity. And so if you've got lambs that have got adequate brown fat and can mobilise that brown fat to generate heat, then you're going to improve lamb survival. So it's still very much a hot topic of research to us. Can we just recap on exactly what brown fat is and what it does? So well, we've changed our opinion of what brown fat is. We used to think that brown fat was like a, the deposits that are only found in young animals. But we now know that brown fat's found uh, in a number of places and not just in the very young. And it seems to be there as a, a chief controller of thermo regulation or you know it, it controls our heat generation systems and uh, it persists through early life so young animals have that ability to sort of increase the thermogenesis increase the heat production and, and that's one of their ways of um, surviving cold challenges provided they've got feed available they can use that energy to, to create heat um, the process by which they do that's quite quite an interesting piece of metabolism because it's called uncoupling and basically it's like a futile cycle. They take energy and they just burn it and burn it to produce heat. And um, th that's sort of like they have a little internal furnace. Not quite so important in ruminants as in, as in other animals but because the ruminants have their rumen which generates a huge amount of heat too. But for a young animal where its rumen hasn't fully developed a, a lamb after birth then um, having that ability to generate heat is critically important for survival. And we really do need to develop it as part of our production drive here in New Zealand. Yeah, it's something where we, we know the genes involved and the processes, we know there's variation in those genes. It's something I think we need to put a big emphasis in sheep breeding on trying to get lambs that are much more robust at birth. We see large numbers of deaths at times, people associate it with, with cold weather, and um, we, we say, oh, well, that's, you know, it's the weather to blame. But it's, it's actually as much to do with the livestock. And there's a number of factors. A key one's birth weight. We know that if you have higher birth weights, then you're less likely to have lamb deaths. But then it's getting lambs that can actually use the fat they've got, use the energy, metabolise it and produce heat. And, 
get up and, and um, we, we talk about teach seeking behaviour, they can latch on quickly and get their first feed and you know, so it's sort of all part of a complex system to improving lamb survival. Can we breed for it? Yep, yeah, we, we can breed for it. We know we know for starters it's obviously breeds of sheep that produce bigger lambs, um, and that's got to be balanced against um, you know fertility and, and fecundity getting the right number of lambs on the ground. So as your triplet numbers go up or you get more quads and then lamb size comes down so they become more vulnerable again so there's a sort of a, a balancing act between getting lots of lambs and getting lambs that are the right size to survive but then um, even within individual animals there are genes that control thermogenesis and we can actually selectively breed for animals that are more robust are less likely to um, not be able to generate heat and, 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 and thus less likely to die if there's a thermal challenge. And I guess as sheep farming goes further and further back into the hills that this becomes more important? Yeah I think so. Um, it, it's sort of, it's, that's a bit of hooks and catches too though because I mean in the high countries you get into the hills um, there's more scrub and there's more cover, there's more you know, valleys and so on that they can get into so you, you sort of, you can get shelter that you wouldn't have out on open plains and um, you, you know you, what you're talking about there is wind run so there's, there's often more shelter from the wind in the hills if they can get down into the valleys and the gullies and into the scrub versus being out on an open plain where we've taken all the wind breaks out and, or not looked after them, those sorts of things. So yeah, it, is, it sort of swings and roundabouts on that one. You've done a lot of research with the Romney breeders, they're on to it? Yeah, yeah, so the Romneys are, are really robust, we, we, we know that if we, if we take one of the gene tests we use, they're right at the top end with that and you know, my point to them always is you don't actually have to breed for it because you guys are on the front foot, but uh, you know, in the Romney trial work we're doing, um, we're getting lamb, average lamb birth weights that are close to six kilograms per lamb. Um, we've, we've had twin lambs coming out over six kilograms each, so the, the ewes carrying 12 kilograms of lamb, and we try and get the triplets up over four kilograms. So, and, and we're not seeing huge amounts. People talk about dystocia or birthing difficulties, but we're not seeing that. And part of the thing there is if, uh, that's about breeding a good ewe. You've got to breed a ewe that can actually carry more lambs and, and can get them out. So she's got a big enough birth canal that they come out okay too. So there's a there's a design thing, if you like, with the ewe to get a ewe that actually births well. And ewes that are too small in the back end that have lambs that are too big in the shoulders and it just doesn't work. <laughs> And of course it's been a pretty tough old year as far as nutrition for the ewes is concerned. Yeah it has been a tough year and I mean I, I haven't heard too many scanning percentage, percentages coming in yet but um, you know there's, there's a bit of a hint there that, that uh, it's going to be hard especially in North Canterbury and those east coast regions where we've had those um, big drought hits that the ewes will be the ones that smart farmers will have dealt to that and made sure that those ewes were good going forward and that the lambs and the hoggets are wearing the cost of a feed shortage but um, yeah I suspect we'll see a little bit of a decline especially through North Canterbury and, and ewe performance this year. Brown fat isn't just a focus for you as far as sheep are concerned, there's also a situation with dairy cows. Yeah, so, so different thing, we know, we know as dairy cows get stressed, I mean it's seen globally as dairy cows um, are producing milk, if there's a heat stress then their productivity drops away and it, it's a similar system again. What's happening there is that those cows lose the ability to actually dissipate heat so it's, it's sort of the opposite end of the spectrum and um, similar processes involved and we're trying to find out if we can find cows that, that have the ability to dissipate heat and actually ramp up their production uh, as well. So uh, it's, it's the same sort of metabolic systems that we're looking at but the, the different outcome, we want, we want cows that are putting all their energy into their milk, they're not at risk of a thermal challenge from being cold but they're at risk from, from being too hot. Not something you typically see um, in New Zealand you, you need high levels of humidity so what you're seeing in temperate climate dairy production is, is, is unlikely to be a, a, a heat stress effect but as you go into tropical dairy production you start to see these heat stress effects coming in. So really it's more than just shelter belts and shade trees? I think it's more than that, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's to do with how they actually um, utilise their energy, how they partition the energy to milk production versus heat generation and how they alter their heat generation in response to the challenge of, of lactation, I think is, and, and, and it's a cow by cow thing, so it's a, it's a, it's a thing that's genetic, and, and so we've got to unpick what's happening there yet, but uh, I think we'll be starting to breed cows one day who are less susceptible to heat stress and can, and can be productive even when they do go under a, a, some sort of stress. And so brown fat obviously exceedingly important. In just a moment though we're going to be talking about getting the best out of your shelter belts. 
Shelter belts, they're obviously there to provide shelter, but can we make money out of them? Most farms around New Zealand have some form of shelter belt, and over time they will have to be renewed. And so thinking about which shelter belt type, species, um, and the size of your shelter belt could bring you a benefit or reduce your costs is something you should always consider. And so looking at, at carbon, for example, where, where we can put a price on, on the tonne of carbon that's sequestered or stored is something um, that will bring you exactly that. So how do we compare pine trees with being the tradition and, and other species? Well, you'd have to look at the whole, the whole shelter belt. So you've got the tree biomass, the, the trunk, the branches, the leaves. You've got herbaceous biomass at the bottom. You've got coarse woody debris and then you've got the soil. And to quantify the carbon, you'd pretty much measure the tree, the dimensions, you estimate the biomass, then you get a carbon figure, which is roughly 50% of a tree's biomass. You literally have to pick out all the herbaceous biomass, weigh them, dry them to get the carbon content of the plants and the leaf litter. And then with the soil, you, depending on how deep you want to look, you take a big soil sample and then you measure the quantities of carbon. And that gives you a total figure for, for a pine species, for example. You do the same with natives. And then you've got a rough idea of how much carbon you got in the tree and then you can upscale it to a shelter belt or then per hectare. That sounds very complicated really. I mean, who's doing it and why? Well, I did it. I spent three years looking at exactly that. And <clears throat> it's not really complicated because the great thing with the tree is you've got it right in front of you, you can touch it. So you measure it, you, you weigh it, you send it to the lab, some of the soil has to go to special machines to do the, 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 the measurements, but ultimately it's fairly straightforward. And in the end it's just a simple add up and you've got a sum. So how do natives compare to what's been used traditionally? Um, so at least in Canterbury the traditional one is pine trees. Um, and, on, and natives have only been coming in for the last, let's say, 10 years where very keen farmers would plant natives. And so far they're doing almost the same thing. I mean it's obvious that the bigger the tree the more carbon you store. But overall I've found that both natives and pine trees range between 110 and 130 tonnes of carbon per hectare. And the interesting bit is that when it comes to the soil carbon component, it's actually the natives that have almost 10 tonnes more. So we're talking roughly 35 to 45 tonnes of carbon per hectare under natives. And so the natives are actually working for you? Yes, they're working for you. And even more interesting, on average, the, the natives that I looked at were 7 to 10 years, whereas the pines were 25 to 30 on average. And so at the current, current point in time, we've got natives being as good as the pine trees, but with a, with a much bigger potential over the next 15, 20 years, once we get both of them to 30 years. I guess you've got species, as far as the natives are concerned, that you can put centre pivots over. Yeah, so the, that's the other problem with sort of further intensification and bringing irrigation on your farm is the pine trees, you can't just chop them at two metres. Whereas with natives, you quite often have the option of, of choosing sc scrubs and more bushy um, species in terms of the shelter belt mix. So you can, yeah, run an irrigator of it. And at the same time, you don't lose the biomass, you don't lose the carbon that you would when you clear the, the pine shelter belt. And... Um, with the irrigation comes you have a lot less of a likelihood in terms of losing the shelter belt because of drought because you you have permanent irrigation and you're planting it usually on very fertile agricultural soils. New Zealanders supporting the natives I mean we know that the natives were here initially and the ground's very good for them. Yeah well which is great and um, we're seeing more and more farmers using them um, not just because it's a public pressure but I think they're also realizing that there's quite a benefit in, benefit in using natives rather than just pine trees that their fathers and grandfathers have used. And part of my research was also looking at, so what other benefits are these shelter belts providing? And the interesting bit was when you compare pine shelter belts and native shelter belts, native shelter belts do a huge amount of extra work for you for free. So it's not just the carbon that they do, but they're the amount of invertebrates and their activity and the microbial activity under the shelter belt is at least twice, if not three times, higher on average right across the Canterbury Plains. So natives are the thing? Well, you d we don't have to change farming from one day to another, but most shelter belts will come 
um, to a point where they have to be cleared, especially the exotic ones. And farmers should definitely think about, well, what am I going to plant next? Am I going to do the same old, same old? Or am I going to go for something that will provide shelter and shade in, a, in a, almost the same amount of time? Or am I going to go for shelter and shade plus all the other benefits? And I guess for you it's a very easy decision. Well, you know, think about that one. You go to, to old farm days and you go for the freebies. Well, if you have the choice between carbon and you get carbon plus more benefits, wouldn't you go for the benefits? Because you get the shelter and the shade anyway from the natives. Why wouldn't you go for, for the improvements and the benefits in the soil that you get? In just a moment, we're going to be talking about the latest as far as RX Plastics are concerned with K-Line. The smaller pods, you've got a whole variety of different nozzles you can use for different purposes. We've got a huge variety. So whether it's for uh, pasture systems, uh, we've got uh, four different sprinkler versions for that. Um, whether it's for supplementary water in orchards or nut farms or... Um, tree crops. So underneath So it branches. actually puts the uh, trajectory of the water underneath the foliage. Uh, very important to make sure that in fact we're not proliferating fungal infections and, and growth in that sort of area. Uh, and then we've also got a tall crop version uh, which we can see uh, behind us, in front of us here. Um, so that has a metre riser uh, that enables us to get over the top of taller crops. So for instance, maybe you've got penny roses or something like that you want to irrigate over the top, then we have a solution for that. So can you vary them? Can you run the same on the five pod for example? Uh, absolutely. You can um, take the five pod pack or our uh, farm pack, um, take the sprinkler and, and uh, adapter out and replace that with any of these options. So uh, we can put a regulated sprinkler for instance if your uh, paddock has um, got a lot of slope on it then we can put regulators and Nelson wind fighters in there. Uh, we can also take those out and put in um, the pop-ups with the low angle so that we can do an orchard. We can also put a stock guard on there uh, and put a tall, tall crop riser on it. So all of those things are potential opportunities. Would you, get, would you use these for effluent? Uh, we're also using these, uh, particularly in Southland, for uh, getting rid of the waste water portion of effluent. Uh, and that's actually working very, very well. Uh, we're applying a very small amount of liquid over a very long time period. Uh, and environmentally, it means that the soil is able to actually capture all of those nutrients long ahead of it ever getting out into Wobatida waterway or um, some other uh, water source. And so there's no ponding? So there's no ponding, there's no runoff. Uh, runoff would only occur if the soils were super saturated and then you could argue it wasn't the water that was applied from the effluent that ponded, it was actually rainfall. Uh, but that's about how you manage those soil conditions. Straight after the break, we're going to be talking rural women and what they can do to make sure that everything is OK on the land. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy she needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? 
Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at ontheland.co.nz. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant, natural, 100% pure, manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant, the way the world is growing. Working with nature, good for the plant, good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. So to admit Canterbury Rural Women New Zealand, you're pretty busy. Ah uh, yes, yes it is, but it's uh, very rewarding and uh, Rural Women is very passionate to me, so um, I enjoy what I do, Rob. What are some of the projects you've got on at the moment? I think weather is one of your focuses. Ah uh, yes, weather, of course, uh, mid-Canterbury, perhaps we're not um, quite as uh, hard affected as what North Canterbury is with the drought but uh, still with the dairy downturn and that it's having a major effect on the farming communities and also on the businesses within Ashburton as well. Um, so um, some of the branches, one of the branches uh, last year in April uh, run a men's dinner um, especially for the men of the district to try and get them together just to have a night out. Uh, we had uh, balladeer and poet uh, Roger Lusby come down from Nelson and entertain the gentlemen for the evening and nobody wanted to go home. <laughs> we had to let them shut the doors on the way out. It Did you? was just a, a really, really great evening, lots of chatter and that's so we felt our job was done from that and um, we're going to do it again this year. They were keen to continue it again so uh, we'll all go there again for, for this April. We're going to host another men's dinner. We also host a ladies dinner um, in, in Winchmore in, in February. Uh, the same type of thing, just bring in a good guest speaker in that there as well and just have a, a night out for the ladies to treat themselves and that. So, That's yeah. very important, isn't it? It's because farming folk are very isolated in general. Yes, yes, um, they are isolated if they choose to be isolated. Um, yes, there's lots of social media that people use now, but um, there is always plenty of groups and organisations out there that uh, people can become involved in if they choose. Um, it is a bit, um, you know, a bit frightening when you do come to a new area. We in Mid Canterbury, a lot of dairy people who are not sort of home based in Mid Canterbury. So yes, it, it can be quite daunting when you do come into a new district, but. Um, Isolation is, is, is a problem and um, so we're busy working on that one to know how can we help these people best. Um, Farming Mums is doing a good job, um, Women's Dairy Network is doing a great job and that as well but I think rural women have got to get in beside those organisations as well and help them out and, um, and, and do our bit there as well. I've, I've found in organisations that I've been in, once you miss a meeting it's easy to miss the next one and then by then it's too late to go back and so you, you stop going. Mm. Um, and so that's important that other people say, hey Rob hasn't been to a meeting for a couple of months. So somebody rings me up and says I'll pick you up at half past six. That's correct. It's the best way to do it. And, <clears> um, but dare I say it, we're all busy people mm. um, and perhaps we just get a wee bit remiss at times in that from, from um, taking taking those steps. But yes, that is a very, very good point and um, we, even in some of our branches, we have a lot of members but we don't see them a lot, but they're still there, but that's not good enough on our behalf. We've got to do more for those people. I'm going to mention depression because that's one of the things that I know your organisation is very hot on yes. for support. Yes. Um, and one of the one of the symptoms is you don't want to talk to anyone mm. you know and mm. the phone will ring and you'll go I'm not home mm. so yes. it's really a case of probably knock on the door and, and and say look I've just bought a, a, a 
I've just done a batch of scones. Yep. I brought half of them around to you. <laughs> that, 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 that is, is, is true. Um, yep, we can't hide behind the telephone and that. We, we do have to uh, face call and that on people. Um, you know, people don't like to admit sometimes they are having problems. There's lots of things in place, even in mid Canterbury, even within rural women, to help these people, but we need to find them. And they're not going to put their hand up and say, excuse me, I need some help. That's right. So we need to ask um, neighbours or friends who notice some difference in, in those people to perhaps give you know rural women, rural support, a ring so that we can help these people. Right. Because we, we're there, we want to help them, but we just don't know how to get to them sometimes. Well, you don't know that they need help no. until somebody gives you the, the nod. That gives, gives us the nod and that. So uh, very aware of it and um, yeah, want, want to do our bit and want rural women to be there. Uh, helping out these people, but do you f do you find that that wives, for example, will ring and say, "Look, I'm a bit concerned about my husband. He spends a lot of time gazing at the wall." Oh, look, I I can't say that, Rob. I haven't had any experience with anybody ringing me in that. Um, I think they that, should. Yeah. <laughs> They, they, they should be, but from my point of view, I think the woman sometimes carries as much burden in the house because, okay, the, the, the farm is out on in those paddocks, but she has to run the house, she has to pay the bills, she has to feed the children, mm. she has to pay the accounts, and she needs some she time as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. So mm. that's when you, I guess, encourage people to ring the neighbours and say, I'm going to Valentine's, come with me. <laughs> Just a, just a bit of that sort yes, of stuff. Yes, that, that retail therapy is... is exactly, is, is, even if you don't buy great. anything, it's no, just nice to go no, to Bally's. It's just nice, nice to get dressed up and get off the farm and just go, go and do something. So. Enterprising women. Yes, oh, yeah. look, we are so proud that um, really within our region, um, last year we had the Uracon Girls uh, win and then, uh, no, that was two years ago, and then last year, Jo Taylor from Ashburton with her Latitude magazine. We were just overwhelmed when she came out as the supreme winner and was most delighted um, with, with that. She's even commented about how it's helped her business in that as well, the uh, exposure, the uh, coverage of winning that award and that has, has been um, very good to her. She's a rural woman member, an individual member and very supportive and very keen to see rural women continue into the future and um, helping us down that line a wee bit as well. Because you have got a wonderful future because I mean I've, I've been associated with the rural women when you were Women's Division Federated Farmers, and yes. that's the wee well, way back that's, now. That's a wee while ago. Yeah, that's that when is. I was a lot younger with my mother. So, <laughs> yes. But the neat yes. thing is that you've actually got an organisation that is taking the women's plight to Wellington, walking through doors without opening them, and saying, hey, listen, guys, we need to be serious about this. That's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think the important thing, Sandra, really, is that you don't have to be one of the ones that goes to Wellington. You can be... There's, there's so many layers, isn't there? So many levels of, of involvement. Yes, there there is a lot, and the national office have got um, you know systems in place where um, you can just receive an email if you are a particular on say health, any health issues, they can email you, um, and you can provide feedback to them. And um, so we are able to contribute, and that is something that I feel is really important with rural women is that even at the grassroots, we do have the opportunity to make a contribution. Mm. And the other neat thing is, going back to what we were talking about, it's rubbing shoulders. It's getting getting away from the farm, yeah. even if it's just for an afternoon's meeting. Yes, yes, an afternoon, and uh, it's just that social networking. Um, uh, you know, a lot of my good friends I've met through Rural Women, I don't see them a lot, and my path doesn't cross a lot with some of those ladies um, at other times. So I really look forward to my rural woman outings and that because it brings me together with with another group of people and, and networking, uh, providing leadership opportunities. It's just endless as to how much you want to give to the organisation. Right, Sandra, thank you very much indeed. In just a moment, we're going to be talking to Ruth Dyson about the weather. Ruth, the weather. Well, it must be a bit of a desperate interview when we go, let's talk about the weather. <laughs> but actually it's a serious topic. So we're all celebrating the start of spring and what a magnificent start we've had to it. We're having predictions of a pretty long, hot summer. 
And while many of us will say that's marvellous, we still have to remember the farming community. They've had quite a mild winter, um, but it's been a pretty dry winter in many parts of Canterbury. So I hope that they get a bit more rain. Uh, you know, it's, it's really so stretched in so many areas for the farming community with the, with the dairy prices, even though they've increased a bit, it's still, it's still pretty low, it's volatile for a lot of them and their futures are looking a bit unsteady compared to many. So, yeah. so celebrate the weather, but just remember other people are relying on it being a little bit different than we might enjoy. Yeah, but it's the third year in a row. It is the third year in a row and I, I guess for some farmers, it doesn't matter how hard they work, and most of them work really, really hard, they can't change the weather. It does look as though the skids have been put under the Ruritanifa scheme. I, I was never convinced that the economics of the Ruritanifa dam stood up, let alone the environmental impacts. Um, that is not an area that, in my view, should be used for dairying. Um, there's a fragility around the Tukituka River that can't be un over underestimated, sorry. so we have to be really careful about any environmental damage through dairying that's caused to the Tukituki River. And most of the local people say that they know what can grow there and it's not stuff that needs high intensive irrigation. So the need for it was hotly debated locally and I'll listen to local people because it's not my area of expertise. The economics were really marginal and I think the potential for contamination of the river we really just said is there a better way of doing this? And we still haven't found out what the cause is as far as the Havelock North problems. Uh, I, th I think that that is a really serious issue in that we haven't found out what the source of contamination was. I don't understand how that could be the case. They're now talking about closing off the Havelock North bores and getting their water from somewhere else. That, that's a solution, but it doesn't provide an answer to the question. How do we manage to get that much contamination and make so many people sick and not know how to fix it? Uh, so it's a bit of a wake-up call from us. We've had information in Canterbury recently about the number of breaches in water quality in our own area. Uh, now there's a big debate about whether it should be chlorinated on top of the debate about whether our water should have fluoride added to it. So these are quite complex issues. I guess for most people we want to say we want to turn on our water, have pure water that's safe to drink. Doesn't seem a lot to ask for in New Zealand. And straight after the break, we're going to be talking to Nathan Guy. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at ontheland.co.nz. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant, natural. 100% pure, manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Brexit, I guess, Minister, the Brexit has started to sort of uh, sort itself out. Where are we sitting now? Well, I think the Brexit vote uh, caught a lot of people by surprise. And I guess the, the 
fundamentals are that it's not going to happen fast. It's going to take a long time to work its way through. It'll be a couple of years before it's likely that they pull the trigger. Uh, then some are saying it'll take several years after that. Uh, could be five or six years for the full um, exit of um, the whole European Union. In the meantime, uh, all of our existing quotas and trading rights are still in place, and we've received assurances from the UK and EU ministers that our trading relationship will continue as it is uh, until that point in time when, of course, uh, the UK chooses to pull that um, exit clause. What I did shortly after the vote went through is I pulled in all the primary sector uh, leaders and chief executives. They met with Minister McClay in my office. We've set up a technical advisory group uh, so that government and industry are well aligned. Uh, we're also looking at a strategy and resourcing going forward. Obviously, a lot of rules that came out from Brussels and the European Union had a big impact on the UK, but now, of course, they'll be having to create all of those themselves. So we know we've got pretty good resources in Brussels, but may not have the right technical experts in London, so we're very mindful of making sure uh, in the next wee while that we focus on uh, the necessary resources for uh, the UK as it moves forward. And I guess the other fundamental point is we're still carrying on with our negotiations to get to the point where we can formally kick off an EUNZ uh, FTA negotiation, and that's making good progress. So hopefully next year we're in a position to uh, talk more about that. Terry, let's not beat around the bush. Suicide. Yeah, it's a very difficult subject to talk about and something that we really want to start front-footing. We had um, a, a member about three weeks ago that committed suicide, a 28-year-old farm manager, father of two daughters, really tragic, no warning, just decided one day that was going to be, the end, be it for him. The same weekend we had another member in a different part of the country also attempt suicide, end up in hospital. And so we've thought, you know, it's really important to to be really open and clear that as a young farmer member in a young farmer club, you've got a whole lot of people around in the same situation as you, and you've got a, a, a slightly different um, time when you're in the, in the young farmers club to forget about the work or personal um, challenges and actually open yourself up to some good well-being things. Yeah, I've been there. I didn't obviously do it, but I was I was definitely at the bottom of the barrel, and you don't talk about it and you're in denial and you are also a passenger. Mm. Yeah and we as people don't know how to confront people that are looking in, in, a, in a dark kind of way. We don't know how to talk to people. It, it's such a taboo in our society. You know, media don't report on it very well. well uh, media don't report it. Yeah well that's starting to change <clears throat> um, but as a society we need to be really upfront that if you need some help let's talk about it. You know, I've got a personal experience too. You know, my sister committed suicide in May this year and she'd had mental health issues for years and we still didn't see it coming. And you know, so what do you do as, as, a, uh, as a, a, a member of the human race to reach out to other people and make sure they're okay? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, what can we do? I, mean... I think part of it is just confronting it. I think um, we've got to acknowledge that our lives aren't always happy. You know, we aren't always in the right space. And some people that suffer from depression or have really bad work or personal stress or a combination of the two, they're unlikely to ask for help. But we've got to be recognising that, actually, you know what? Tom over there just isn't his usual self. And a lot of the research that's been going on at the moment is, actually, why don't you go and ask? How are you feeling? You're not feeling like you're going to commit suicide, are you? Because if you are, let's talk about it. And that's really foreign to us to confront like that. Yeah, I mean, I've been to services where we had somebody's committed suicide and, and, and the person taking the services said it's not okay to do that. And I'm going, you have no idea no. what you've just said? No. So it, 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 you've got to be non-judgmental, you know. People have it tough and people cope with their whatever pressures they have in a different way. Some people become withdrawn, <clears throat> some people become almost the opposite to compensate. So it's looking for that change of behaviour and then just front-footing it. Yeah, and people who are normally cheerful, say good day, how are you doing, don't. Yeah, yeah. And then what do you do with that bit of information once you know something's not quite right? 
So in our situation, being a young farmer club environment, it's actually getting a whole lot of people together and go, you know what, let's do something uh, on your farm this weekend. What do you need doing? Should we mend some fences or should we help with tailing or whatever it might be at the particular time of year? Or simply, hey, let's just go and have a drink or let's go and have some lunch somewhere. Mm. Just I think lunches are great. I seriously do, because you can sit down around a table and have a couple of glasses of wine. But I think you are dead right when you say we don't use that word suicide. No, uh, it's too confronting for people. We've got to change that barrier. Hard one, but I guess people who are members of your organisation, if they miss three meetings... Yeah, where are they? Yeah, mm. Why aren't they here? Um, but it's, it's, I guess as confronting as suicide is, it's part of a bigger, broader issue. So it's that whole health and well-being of people. Yes, the extreme end is suicide, but there's all those other bits in between. So, you know, people don't do enough exercise. You know, we represent farmers. You think farmers are out in the great outdoors, but actually a lot of farmers, not necessarily young farmers particularly, but farmers in general aren't physically fit. So you know, They spend a lot of time on four-wheel motorbikes and they're they? yeah. Yeah, they drive a tractor rather than you know rather than a desk, but it's the same same problem that I would have is I don't get out and do enough exercise either. So how do we think through things that we actually need to allocate time to do those sorts of things to look after ourselves, you know, to sleep well, to eat well. Um, you know, we're not very good at going to the doctor, particularly men, right? So oh, and farming men probably hopeless. the worst. Absolutely hopeless. So it's it's a whole change of mentality. But I think the more that we start demonstrating that it's okay to talk about things like suicide then the more it becomes acceptable from a, a wider group of people to confront it. And hopefully we'll start to see a reduction rather than an increase in these numbers. We've got a terrible suicide rate in this country that no one knows about. You know, it's nearly as bad as the road toll. We know about the road toll every week. Yeah, because it's all over <coughs> the media. Right. And there's active measures that can be done to prevent uh, the, the death rate in cars. What we don't know is how many seemingly accidents or those things are suicides rather than just bad traffic or bad driving. Yeah, you know, There's various ways of committing suicide, right? Well, I'm going to talk about my case, literally. I was, and many people will have known because I've come out and talked about it, but I knew that I didn't want to blow my head off because that was a stigma. Mm. Um, but I was very happy for a tree to fall on top of my car or a big truck to come right. through a red light. Right. Same thing. Um, and there was must have been occasions when I thought, if I cross the line, the centre line now, and there's a truck coming towards me, buddy, you're gone. Mm. And it was very tempting, yeah. you know, because it's an accident. But in the back of my mind, of course, I go, my children know that I'm a better driver than that. Yeah. <laughs> you see? But I was a passenger, Yeah, Terry. That's right. I was an absolute passenger, and, and it was when I suddenly went, jeez, hang on, you're, you're, you're putting out there to the universe that you want mm. that to happen. Mm. You're an idiot. And so I went and, sort, and got sorted. I'm now taking a little white pills every morning. <laughs> I've got my sense of humour back. Yeah, yeah, which is really important. So one of the committees I sit in uh, at a national level is with the uh, New Zealand Police, and it's the Police and Rural Stakeholders um, Committee around making sure that rural communities are safe. And the obvious things are rural crime, but also, you know, often in small communities, the person that's uh, in the thick of anything that goes wrong is the, is the local cop. So, you know, things are not going well on the farm, the bank might be coming in to have that really hard conversation. Um, then that person goes off, the, the farmer might do a range of different things to let out that stress. One of them might be to take the gun out to the back paddock and blow his head off, as you say. Mm. But it might be getting really aggressive, throwing things around, getting um, into the car and sounding off. So how do we make sure that people like the local cops, people like... Uh, is, is people there in cafes, you know, people that you interact with every day are mm. actually thinking in the back of their mind, I wonder how that person is today. Is there a role, do you think, for the accountants and the bank managers? Because they're the ones normally with the bad news, aren't they? Yeah, and to look, to be absolutely fair, the banks have been brilliant this year. We know it's tough, right? We know there are going to be farms that get foreclosed at some point, and some probably already have, but it's not wide stream or widespread. So the banks are being really responsible in terms of last resort and being really open and communicative compared to other time frames in, in the past where we've had these downturns. And they're really aware of impacts that uh, delivering bad news is. Now whether they're trained for it I don't know. They should be. But yes, absolutely. And I think it's more than just delivering the letter and I think they've really got to be able to 
have some communication with the Rural Support Trust mm. or Rural Women New Zealand or Young Farmers yeah. or whoever it may be. Yeah. And that's just one scenario. So you've got other scenarios, for, particularly in our constituency with young people, a relationship breakdown. Um, you know, if you're young and you haven't gone through a serious relationship breakup before, it can be pretty devastating, as we know. Mm. Um, and how do they deal with it? Being out in the country, not around lots of people, thinking, well, this is how I'm supposed to feel. Um, you know, and if you're the kind of person that thinks negatively anyway, it could be a trigger point. So, again, that contact with people is so crucial. Terry, thank you very much indeed for coming out and using that word suicide. Now, if you'd like to revisit Terry's conversation with me, you can do that on our website, which is on theland.co.nz. I'm Rob Coe Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the program, but I will be back at the same time next week. Until then, 